The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 16. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, edited by Frank Woodworth Pine, Chapter 16. Braddock's Expedition. The British government, not choosing to permit the union of the colonies as proposed at Albany, and to trust that union with their defence, lest they should thereby grow too military, and feel their own strength, suspicions and jealousies at this time being entertained of them, sent over General Braddock with two regiments of regular English troops for that purpose. He landed at Alexandria in Virginia, and thence marched to Fredericktown in Maryland, where he halted for carriages, our assembly apprehending, from some information, that he had conceived violent prejudices against them, as averse to the service wished me to wait upon him, as from them, but as postmaster-general, under the guise of proposing to settle with him the mode of conducting with most celerity and certainty the dispatches between him and the government of the several provinces, with whom he must necessarily have continual correspondence, and of which they supposed to pay the expense. My son accompanied me on this journey. We found the general at Fredericktown, waiting impatiently for the return of those he had sent through the back parts of Maryland and Virginia to collect wagons. I stayed with him several days, dined with him daily, and had full opportunity of removing all his prejudices by the information of what the assembly had before his arrival actually done, and were still willing to do, to facilitate his operations. When I was about to depart, the returns of wagons to be obtained were brought in, by which it appeared that they amounted only to twenty-five, and not all of those were in serviceable condition. The general and all the officers were surprised, declared the expedition was then at an end, being impossible, and exclaimed against the ministers for ignorantly landing them in a country destitute of the means of conveying their stores, baggage, etc., not less than one hundred and fifty wagons being necessary. I happened to say I thought it was pity they had not been landed rather in Pennsylvania, as in that country almost every farmer had his wagon. The general eagerly laid hold of my words and said, then you, sir, who are a man of interest there, can probably procure them for us, and I beg you will undertake it. I asked what terms were to be offered the owners of the wagons, and I was desired to put on paper the terms that appeared to me necessary. This I did, and they were agreed to, and a commission and instructions accordingly prepared immediately. What those terms were will appear in the advertisement I published as soon as I arrived at Lancaster, which being, from the great and sudden effect it produced, a piece of some curiosity, I shall insert it at length as follows. Advertisement. Lancaster, April 26, 1755. Whereas one hundred and fifty wagons, with four horses to each wagon, and fifteen hundred saddle or pack horses are wanted, for the service of His Majesty's forces, now about to rendezvous at Wills Creek, and His Excellency General Braddock, having been pleased to empower me, to contract for the hire of the same, I hereby give notice that I shall attend for that purpose at Lancaster from this day to next Wednesday evening, and at York from next Thursday morning till Friday evening, where I shall be ready to agree for wagons and teams, or single horses, on the following terms. Fees. 1. That there shall be paid for each wagon, with four good horses and a driver, fifteen shillings per diem, and for each able horse, with a pack saddle, or other saddle and furniture, two shillings per diem, and for each able horse, without a saddle, eighteen pence per diem. 2. That the pay commence from the time of their joining the forces at Wills Creek, which must be on or before the twenty ninth of May ensuing, and that a reasonable allowance be paid over and above for the time necessary for their travelling to Wills Creek and home again after their discharge. 3. Each wagon and team, and every saddle or pack horse, is to be valued by indifferent persons 
chosen between me and the owner, and in case of the loss of any wagons, team, or other horse in the service, the price accordingly to such valuation is to be allowed and paid. 4. Seven days' pay is to be advanced and paid in hand by me to the owner of each wagon and team, or horse, at the time of contracting, if required, and the remainder to be paid by General Braddock, or by the paymaster of the army, at the time of their discharge, or from time to time, as it shall be demanded. 5. No drivers of wagons, or persons taking care of the hired horses, are on any account to be called upon to do the duty of soldiers, or to be otherwise employed than in conducting or taking care of their carriages or horses. 6. All oats, Indian corn, or other forage that wagons or horses bring to the camp more than is necessary for the subsistence of the horses is to be taken for the use of the army, and a reasonable price paid for the same. Note, my son, William Franklin, is empowered to enter into like contracts with any person in Cumberland County. B. Franklin To the inhabitants of the counties of Lancaster, York, and Cumberland, friends and countrymen, being occasionally at the camp of Frederick a few days since, I found the general and officers extremely exasperated on account of their not being supplied with horses and carriages which had been expected from this province, as most able to furnish them. But, though the dissensions between our governor and assembly, money had not been provided, nor any steps taken for that purpose. It was proposed to send an armed force immediately into these counties, to seize as many of the best carriages and horses as should be wanted, and compel as many persons into the service as would be necessary to drive and take care of them. I apprehended that the progress of British soldiers through these counties, on such an occasion, especially considering the temper they are in, and their resentment against us, would be attended with many and great inconveniences to the inhabitants, and therefore more willingly took the trouble of trying first what might be done by fair and equitable mean. The people of these back countries have lately complained to the assembly that a sufficient currency was wanting. You have an opportunity of receiving and dividing among you a very considerable sum, for, if the service of this expedition should continue, as it is more than probable it will, for one hundred and twenty days, the hire of these wagons and horses will amount to upward of thirty thousand pounds, which will be paid to you in silver and gold of the king's money. The service will be light and easy, for the army will scarce march above twelve miles per day, and the wagons and baggage horses, as they carry those things that are absolutely necessary for the welfare of the army, must march with the army, and no faster, and are, for the army's sake, always placed where they can be most secure, whether in a march or in a camp, if you are really, as I believe you are, good and loyal subjects to His Majesty, you may now do a most acceptable service, and make it easy for yourselves, for three or four of such as cannot separately spare from the business of their plantations a wagon, and four horses, and a driver, may do it together, one furnishing the wagon, another one or two horses, and another the driver, and divide the pay proportionally between you. But if you do not this service to your king and country voluntarily, when such good pay and reasonable terms are offered you, your loyalty will be strongly suspected. The king's business must be done. So many brave troops, come so far for your defense, must not stand idle through your backwardness to do what may be reasonably expected from you. Wagons and horses must be had, Violent measures will probably be used, and you will be left to seek for recompense where you can find it, and your case perhaps be little pitied or regarded. I have no particular interest in this affair as except the satisfaction of endeavouring to do good. I shall have only my labour for my pains. If this method of obtaining the wagons and horses is not likely to succeed, I am obliged to send word to the general in fourteen days and I suppose Sir John St. Clair, the hussar, with a body of soldiers, will immediately enter the province for the purpose, which I shall be sorry to hear, because I am very sincerely and truly your friend and well-wisher, B. Franklin. 
I received of the general about eight hundred pounds, to be dispersed in advance money to the wagon owners, etc. But the sum being insufficient, I advanced upward of two hundred pounds more, and in two weeks the one hundred and fifty wagons with two hundred and fifty-nine carriage horses were on the march for the camp. The advertisement promised payment according to the valuation, in case any wagon or horse should be lost. The owners, however, alleging they did not know General Braddock, or what dependence might be had on his promise, insisted on my bond for the performance, which I accordingly gave them. While I was at the camp, supping one evening with the officers of Colonel Dunbar's regiment, he represented to me his concern for the subalterns, who, he said, were generally not in affluence, and could ill afford, in this dear country, to lay in the stores that might be necessary for so long a march through a wilderness where nothing was to be purchased. I commiserated their care, and resolved to endeavour procuring them some relief. I said nothing, however, to him of my intention, but wrote the next morning to the committee of the assembly, who had the disposition of some public money, warmly recommending the case of these officers to their consideration, and proposing that a present should be sent them of necessaries and refreshments. My son, who had some experience of a camp life and of its wants, drew up a list for me, which I enclosed in my letter. The committee approved and used such diligence that, conducted by my son, the stores arrived at the camp as soon as the wagons. They consisted of twenty parcels, each containing six pounds of sugar-loaf, six pounds of good muscovado, one pound good green tea, one pound good bohiadu, six pounds loaf sugar, six pounds good muscovado, one pound good green tea, one pound good bohi six pounds good ground coffee, six pounds chocolate, one to two hundred weight best white biscuit, one to two pounds pepper, one quart best white wine, vinegar, one Gloucester cheese, one cake containing twenty pounds good butter, two dozen old Madeira wine, two gallons Jamaican spirits, one bottle flour of mustard, two well-cured hams, one to two dozen dried tongues, six pounds rice, six pounds of raisins. These twenty parcels, well packed, were placed on as many horses, each parcel with the horse being intended as a present for one officer. They were very thankfully received, and the kindness acknowledged by letters to me from the colonels of both regiments, in the most grateful terms. The general, too, was highly satisfied with my conduct in procuring him the wagons, etc., and readily paid my account of disbursements thanking me repeatedly, and requesting my further assistance in sending provisions after him. I undertook this also, and was busily employed in it till we heard of his defeat, advancing for the service of my own money, upwards of one thousand pounds sterling, of which I sent him an account. It came to his hands, luckily for me, a few days before the battle, and he returned me immediately an order on the paymaster, for the round sum of one thousand pounds, leaving the remainder to the next account. I considered this payment as good luck, having never been able to obtain that remainder, of which more hereafter. The general was, I think, a brave man, and might probably have made a figure as a good officer in some European war. But he had too much self-confidence, too high an opinion of the validity of regular troops, and too mean a one of both Americans and Indians. George Crowen, our Indian interpreter, joined him on his march with one hundred of those people who might have been of great use to his army as guides, scouts, etc., if he had treated them kindly, but he slighted and neglected them, and they gradually left him. In conversation with him one day, he was giving me some account of his intended progress. After taking Fort Duquesne, says he, I am to proceed to Niagara, and having taken that to Fontenac, if the season will allow me, and I suppose it will, for Duquesne can hardly detain me above three or four days, and I see nothing that can obstruct my march to Niagara. Having before revolved in my mind the long line his army must take in the march by a very narrow road to be cut for them through the woods and bushes, and also what I had read of a former defeat of fifteen hundred French who invaded the Iroquois country, 
I had conceived some doubts and some fears for the event of the campaign, but I ventured only to say, To be sure, sir, if you arrive well before Duquesne, with these fine troops, so well provided with artillery, that place not yet completely fortified, and as we hear with no very strong garrison, can probably make but a short resistance. The only danger I apprehend of obstruction to your march is from ambuscades of Indians, who, by constant practice, are dexterous in laying and executing them, and the slender line, near four miles long, which your army must make, may expose it to be attacked by surprise in its flanks, and to be cut like a thread into several pieces, which from their distance cannot come up in time to support each other. He smiled at my ignorance and replied, These savages may indeed be a formidable enemy to your raw American militia, but upon the king's regular and disciplined troops, sir, it is impossible they should make any impression. I was conscious of an impropriety in my disputing with a military man in matters of his profession, and said no more. The enemy, however, did not take the advantage of his army which I apprehended its long line of march exposed it to, but let it advance without interruption till within nine miles of the place, and then, when more in a body, for it had just passed river where the front had halted till all were come over, and in a more open part of the woods than any it had passed, attacked its advanced guard by heavy fire from behind trees and bushes, which was the first intelligence the general had of an enemy's being near him. This guard being disordered, the general hurried his troops up to their assistance, which was done in great confusion, though wagons, baggage, and cattle, and presently the fire came upon their flank. The officers, being on horseback, were more easily distinguished, picked out as marks, and fell very fast, and the soldiers were crowded together in a huddle, having or hearing no orders, and standing to be shot at, till two-thirds of them were killed, and then being seized with a panic, the whole fled with precipitation. The wagoners took each horse out of its team, and scampered. Their example was immediately followed by others, so that all the wagons, provisions, artillery, and stores were left to the enemy. The general being wounded was brought off with difficulty. His secretary, Mr. Shirley, was killed by his side, and out of eighty-six officers, sixty-three were killed or wounded, and seven hundred and fourteen men killed out of the eleven hundred. These eleven hundred had been picked men from the whole army. The rest had been left behind with Colonel Dunbar, who was to follow with the heavier part of the stores, provisions, and baggage. The flyers, not being pursued, arrived at Dunbar's camp, and the panic they brought with them instantly seized him and all his people, and though he had now above one thousand men, and the enemy, who had beaten Braddock, did not at most exceed four hundred Indians and French together, instead of proceeding and endeavouring to recover some of the lost honour, he ordered all the stores, ammunition, etc., to be destroyed, that he might have more horses to assist his flight towards the settlements, and less lumber to remove. He was there met with requests from the governors of Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, that he should post his troops on the frontier, so as to afford some protection to the inhabitants. But he continued his hasty march through all the country, not thinking himself safe, till he arrived at Philadelphia, where the inhabitants could protect him. This whole transaction gave us Americans the first suspicion that our exalted ideas of the power of British regulars had not been well founded. Begin footnote. Other accounts of this expedition and defeat may be found in Fisk's Washington and His Country, or Lodge's George Washington, Volume 1. End footnote. In the first march, too, from their landing till they got beyond the settlements, they had plundered and stripped the inhabitants, totally ruining some poor families. Besides insulting, abusing, and confining the people if they remonstrated, this was enough to put us out of conceit of such defenders, if we had really wanted any. How different was the conduct of our French friends in 1781, who, during a march through the most inhabited part of our country, from Rhode Island to Virginia, near seven hundred miles, occasioned not the smallest complaint for the loss of a pig, a chicken, 
or even an apple. Captain Ormy, who was one of the general's aides de camp, and, being grievously wounded, was brought off with him, and continued with him to his death, which happened in a few days, told me that he was totally silent all the first day, and at night only said, Who would have thought it? That he was silent again the following day, saying only at last, We shall better know how to deal with them another time, and died in a few minutes after. The secretary's papers, with all the general's orders, instructions, and correspondence, falling into the enemy's hands, they selected and translated into French a number of articles which they printed to prove the hostile intentions of the British court before the declaration of war. Among these I saw some letters of the general to the ministry, speaking highly of the great service I had rendered the army, and recommending me to their notice. David Hume, too, who was some years after secretary to Lord Hertford, then minister to France, and afterward to General Conway, when secretary of state, told me he had seen among the papers in that office letters from Braddock highly recommending me. But the expedition having been unfortunate, my service, it seems, was not thought of much value, for those recommendations were never of any use to me. As to rewards for myself, I asked only one, which was that he would give orders to his officers not to enlist any more of our bought servants, and that he would discharge such as had been already enlisted. This he readily granted, and several were accordingly returned to their masters on my application. Dunbar, when the command devolved on him, was not so generous. He being at Philadelphia on his retreat, or rather flight, I applied to him for the discharge of the servants of three poor farmers in Lancaster County that he had enlisted, reminding him of the late general's orders on that head. He promised me that if the masters would come to him at Trenton, where he should be in a few days on his march to New York, he would there deliver their men to them. They accordingly were at the expense and trouble of going to Trenton, and there he refused to perform his promise, to their great loss and disappointment. As soon as the loss of the wagons and horses was generally known, all the owners came upon me for the valuation which I had given bond to pay. Their demands gave me a great deal of trouble, my acquainting them that the money was ready in the paymaster's hands, but that orders for paying it must first be obtained from General Shirley, and my assuring them that I had applied to that general by letter. But he being at a distance, an answer could not soon be received, and they must have patience. All this was not sufficient to satisfy, and some began to sue me. General Shirley at length relieved me from this terrible situation, by appointing commissioners to examine the claims, and ordering payment. They amounted to near twenty thousand pounds, which to pay would have ruined me. Before we had the news of this defeat, the two doctors' bond came to me with a subscription paper for raising money to defray the expense of a grand firework, which it was intended to exhibit at a rejoicing on receipt of the news of our taking Fort Duquesne. I looked grave and said it would, I thought, be time enough to prepare for the rejoicing when we knew we should have occasion to rejoice. They seemed surprised that I did not immediately comply with their approval. Why the devil, says one of them, you surely don't suppose that the fort will not be taken. I don't know that it will not be taken, but I know that the events of war are subject to great uncertainty. I gave them the reasons of my doubting, the subscription was dropped, and the projectors thereby missed the mortification they would have undergone if the firework had been prepared. Dr. Bond, on some other occasion afterward, said that he did not like Franklin's forebodings. Governor Morris, who had continually worried the assembly with message after message before the defeat of Braddock, to beat them into the making of acts to raise money for the defense of the province, without taxing, among others, the proprietary estates, and had rejected all their bills for not having such an exempting clause, now redoubled his attacks with more hope of success, the danger and necessity being greater. The assembly, however, continued firm, believing they had justice on their side, and that it would be giving up an essential right if they suffered the governor to amend their money bills. In one of the last, indeed, which was for granting fifty thousand pounds, his proposed amendment was only of a single word, 
the bill expressed that all estates real and personal were to be taxed those of the proprietaries not excepted his amendment was for not read only a small but very material alteration however when the news of this disaster reached england our friends there whom we had taken care to furnish with all the assembly's answers to the governor's messages raised a clamour against the proprietaries for their meanness and injustice in giving their governor such instructions some going so far as to say that by obstructing the defence of their province they forfeited their right to it they were intimidated by this and sent orders to their receiver-general to add five thousand pounds of their money to whatever sum might be given by the assembly for such purpose this being notified to the house was accepted in lieu of their share of a general tax and a new bill was formed with an exempting clause which passed accordingly but by this act i was appointed one of the commissioners for disposing of the money sixty thousand pounds i had been active in modelling the bill and procuring its passage and had at the same time drawn a bill for establishing and disciplining a volunteer militia which i carried through the house without much difficulty as care was taken in it to leave the quakers at their liberty to promote the association necessary to form the militia i wrote a dialogue stating and answering all the objections i could think of for such a militia which was printed and had as i thought great effect End of chapter sixteen